My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We're going to take a look today at the passages when Jesus was being crucified where he referenced Psalm 22 and how what he was doing was not a cry of distress wondering why it was that God abandoned him as is characterized unfortunately by some Christians even but especially by those who attack Christianity and attack the divinity of Christ saying you know what kind of savor do you have that he claims to be God and here he is wondering why God's abandoning him in his darkest hour and that's not what he was doing what he was doing was similar to if we were to sing a line or two from a popular song and try and get that stuck in the head of the person that we're singing it to so they would know what song we're referencing and all of a sudden they'd be flooded and filled with the lyrics of the rest of that song so what jesus was doing was pointing them towards the part in the scroll where it would say my god my god why hast thou forsaken me or in um in the hebrew it says in matthew 27 46 and about the ninth hour jesus cried with a loud voice saying eli eli lama sabachthani that is to say my god my god why hast thou forsaken me which the point of this is to point us to what is now identified as psalms 22. at the time it would have been the part to identify start reading where it says this um, at the time it wasn't divided up with chapters and and uh verses as it is for us now and so he was saying hey you know that part of that song where we sing and it says this you know yeah think about that song and think about what's happening right now and let's just let that run through your head and think about if what you're seeing might not be the same thing as what we used to sing about that um and you know actually probably still do sing about it because <laughs> this wasn't 2000 years in the past at the time um you know so he's he's reminding them of what's in the scroll and he's reminding them to go back to the part where it says this and for us today that is now psalms chapter 22 and there's all kinds of directions we could go with this there's just so much here there's literally a year's worth of of possibilities just within psalms 22 and the parallel accounts in the gospels but we want to do something a little less traditional here and take a look at uh the meanings of numbers because when i did this and i looked at this and i saw that it was matthew 27 46 and mark 15 34 that this passage in psalms 22 was referencing i started thinking about what do these numbers mean because God invented numbers and God invented the meanings of numbers. And I believe that 22 represents um, revelation. And just thinking, you know, um, instantly brainstorming, I recognize Matthew 27. Well, there's 27 books in the New Testament. And so then I'm thinking, you know, what's 46? What's 15? What's 34? You know, and it's interesting that Jesus is there on the cross and he's pointing us to a chapter that is numbered the number of revelation and so we know that the book of revelation has 22 chapters and we look at that and it says right from the beginning the revelation of jesus christ so it's telling you that this is this is representing revelation and this is the 27th book of the new testament um so the revelation of jesus christ we go to habakkuk 2 2 and we look at that and it says and the lord answered me and he said write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it well write the vision and make it plain is to have something revealed that's revelation this is habakkuk 2 2 22. it's not verse 22 or chapter two, but it's a two and a two paired together making a 22 and we see the same thing in matthew in matthew 2 2 you see saying where is he is that born king of the jews for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him they're seeing his star in the east it's been revealed it's a revelation matthew 2 2 tells us about a revelation so going back to psalms 22 i'm thinking okay well if 22 is revelation and here's jesus on the cross pointing us towards the chapter that is revelation which also by the way is as is divided today is the 500th chapter of the bible 
the 1000th chapter of the Bible is John 3, where Jesus tells Nicodemus that you have to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. And of course, that's the one with our famous John 316 verse that we love to quote. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so let's go to the account and we see Matthew 27, 46 is the parallel passage here. And it says, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the parallel passage is in Mark 15, 34. And it says, in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And what's interesting is that this passage is used to mock the divinity of Jesus, but what we actually see here, just a few verses above this, there's, it says in verse 29 of Mark 15, and they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, ah, thou that destroys the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests mocking said amongst themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And then again, going back in Matthew, and I always think, you know, the, the way to best identify the, the, the heretic is if they're thinking that you've overestimated your ability to trust God, because we see here in Matthew 27, 43, it says, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now if you will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. And that's what we call ourselves. We call ourselves sons of God. And so here it is, he's being mocked. He saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if you will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And so this is just before this passage. And this is, it describes the, the parting of, uh, of his garments. They, they cast lots. Uh, here it is in verse 35. And they crucified it and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them. And upon my vesture did they cast lots. So. We see here that this is, these are the details being described in Psalms 22. Now, we get a double revelation if we go to Psalms 22 and verse 22. And we see, it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will praise thee. So now we go to Acts chapter 2, and it's, would you believe it? Verse 22. And it says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Here's the name being proclaimed, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. And he goes on to explain how they crucified him and how he rose again. And it quotes Psalm 16, talking about uh, being, being resurrected. And so we see here that Psalms 22, 22 points us to Acts 2, 22, which talks about the resurrection of Jesus, which also then points us back to Psalm 16, which was talking about that. But this is the way that the New Testament is constructed, is that it's always pointing back to quotations in the Old Testament. So let's go to this first verse here again, and it's, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? And we see that it's Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. So I'm thinking, okay, what do these numbers mean? We've looked at how 22 represents revelation, but what's 27? What's 46? What's 15? What's 34? So I started thinking, just going through, and I started with 15. Well, actually, actually, I started with 27 being the number of uh, books that's in the New Testament. And the 27th book is Revelation. So that ties in with the 22 there. Um, but there's 27 books in the New Testament. If you actually think about what New Testament is, 
He says, this is my blood of the New Testament for the remission of sins. So New Testament, instead of just thinking about it as, you know, that set of books, New Testament is the remission of sins. New Testament is the inheritance. New Testament is what Jesus did for us. Um, so it's not just about thinking about a set of books, a set of writings. What does the word New Testament mean? This is the blood of the New Testament for the remission of sins. Um, and so New Testament is the good news. New Testament is our inheritance. New Testament is Jesus fulfilling the covenant on our behalf so that we don't have to because we can't. So then the next thing that I thought of was Mark 15. And I'm thinking, well, what's 15? And I don't know, you know, I mean, like I said, you can, you can look up on the internet what various different numbers mean and everyone's got their own theories. And well, to put it nicely, uh, we've all heard what theories are like you know, opi or opinions are like. Um, but to me, this is an invitation to dig in and start taking a look at things on a deeper level and maybe just use some non-traditional methods of, of looking in the scriptures. And so we're looking at uh, Mark 15, and what was it? It was Mark 15, 34. So I'm thinking, okay, let's go to Genesis 15 and see what verses three and four are. And so in Genesis 15, and this is what I just covered in the previous uh, video, it says, And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And so here it is. This is the promise of God to Abraham that there's going to be a seed that's going to be his heir. And that seed is Jesus. And so then we had Matthew 27, 46. So we already covered four, but what's verse six say? And it says, and he believed in the Lord and counted it to him for righteousness. So if we go 15, three, four, and six, we find the gospel message. Jesus is going to come. And if we believe that it's accounted for righteousness, the gospel message is right there in Genesis 15, three, four, and six that we were pointed to by looking at where the quotation in Matthew and Mark of my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me originated. So think a little bit deeper. And this recalls that this tied in when we were studying this before about um, looking at Isaiah. And it says, behold, the Lord proclaimed until the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And that tied into Isaiah 40:10, which is, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. And I tied this in with Luke 15. And what do you know? It's not only Luke 15. But look at this, verses three and four. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And what's verse six? Verse six says, And when he come, cometh home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. So here's the gospel message in Luke 15, three and four, that Jesus seeks out that which is lost, and then he rejoices when it's, when it's returned to him. So then I'm thinking more about the fact of, you know, well, what about the 46? Because it was uh, Matthew 27, 46, and Mark 15, 34. So we looked at some 15, 3, and 4s. But what is this 46? So I thought, well, there's 27 books in the New Testament. But the 46th book overall, what is that? So we go to the 46th book overall, and the 46th book overall is 1 Corinthians. And I'm thinking, 1 Corinthians, wait a minute. What about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4? What is that? That seems kind of vaguely perhaps familiar. And so 1 Corinthians 15, which is the 46th book, of the of the New Testament, of which there are 27 books. So that's the Matthew 27, 46, New Testament, the 46th book, the 15th chapter, verses 3 and 4. 
For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so there you have it. I mean, we, we follow this trail where we start out with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it points us to a chapter of Psalms that tells us that this is a revelation. And it's quoted in Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. And the, in the New Testament, which is 27, in book number 46, in the 15th chapter, in the third and fourth verse, there it is, once again, the gospel message. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And in, just to top it off with verse 6, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. I'm actually noticing this just now, having now read verse 6 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, and that is that it says that he was seen of above 500 brethren, and this just turns, turns us right back to where we started from. Psalms 22 is the 500th chapter which to me is amazing. So here we are, we're, we're saying that Psalms 22, the number of Revelation is the 500th chapter, and it mentions having his name proclaimed in the midst of the brethren um, and being seen. Well, seen is what Revelation means. So right here, now we're pointed straight back to Psalm 22 and verse 22. Again, where it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And here's another thing I noticed. Um, if we go to John chapter 3, again, in verse, chapter 3 and verse 3, well, that's a 33. And it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So here we are, the thousandth chapter. You know, thousand represents kingdom of God, and here's Jesus talking about the kingdom of God, and it's the thousandth chapter, and it's John 3, 3, 33. Jesus died at 33. And so, what else is 33? Got me thinking, because I have some notes here that I looked up various forms of the word salvation. And my salvation occurs 33 times in the King James Bible. Then the next note that I have is that thy salvation occurs 27 times, and that 27 is the New Testament. So the, uh, the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins, is thy salvation. What else is 27 is liberty. The, the shedding of blood for the New Testament is thy salvation and is liberty. And then we look at our salvation. Our salvation occurs eight times. And so we know that eight is the day of circumcision. We know that eight is new beginnings. We know that Jesus rose again on the eighth day. Um, and we see here in 1 Peter 3.20, it says uh, that there were eight souls saved by water um, on the ark. And then, uh, so we know that eight represents new beginnings and it represents the circumcision not of the flesh, which is what it originally was, but the circumcising, circumcising of the heart. And that takes us back here, Luke 2.21. And when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So, you know, that's our salvation. And that's just amazing to me that we see the way these things come around. And to me, this is just an absolute and unbelievable indicator that the verse divisions and the chapter divisions are inspired and that they're there by design and that the number of times words are used is by design and that God was hands-on in giving us his word, that it wasn't something that was just left up to men to figure out how to, how to convert it from the original languages into what we have today. I believe that you can look at it and you can say, well, this verse can be misunderstood or even abused or weaponized, and therefore this word is translated wrong, 
or this chapter division doesn't belong there. That's a mistake. Um, I think that you're using the wrong set of standards if that's how you're looking at it and determining whether something's inspired or not. I think when you look at it and you see the way that things are tied together, that you can have no choice but to come to the conclusion that this is by a design and that this is by a plan and that things are woven together and and just the way that it, it blends together and creates a tapestry is amazing to me. So let's just finish here and see. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen.